2020 was a weird year. I think we can all agree that this particular year will go down as one of the most chaotic of our lifetime. A global pandemic forced all of us into lockdown, there was a new protest or riot every other week, Vin Diesel released not one, but two pop songs, I Turned 30, and KFC has their own console coming out with built-in chicken warmer. It seemed like not a day could go by where something wasn't on fire, sometimes literally, and all most of us could do was wait for the days to tick on by. The one upside to all this, if you could call it an upside, is that all this nonsense left us with more downtime in which to play some video games, and there was plenty of quality entertainment to distract ourselves with. Just like I've done the last several years, I whittled down everything I've played this year into this top 10. For those of you that need a refresher on my criteria for what qualifies, I only include titles I've extensively played firsthand, and there's no way I can play everything. Early access stuff doesn't count, and neither do remasters or re-releases. Let me clarify real quick that remakes and remasters are two different things. Remakes are totally fine since they are new games built from the ground up. And, of course, this list is my opinion based on my personal tastes, and you're both free and likely to disagree. Let me cap off this crappy year by presenting to you my top 10 games of 2020. Okay, let me explain. I know that Bugsnax developed a reputation as a meme game pretty much the instant it was announced, and this led many people to dismiss it outright. I'm also guilty of that. When I saw that first trailer, I didn't think I'd even play Bugsnax, let alone enjoy it to the degree that I did, but here we are. Exploring the colorful Snacktooth Island to discover and capture all the bizarre half-bug, half-snack creatures provides a pretty enjoyable gotta catch em all gameplay loop. It definitely gets repetitive in the latter half, especially if you're a completionist, once you realize grabbing all the critters boils down to the same handful of techniques. But the surprisingly endearing cast of characters I interacted with along the way kept me going. Every inhabitant of the island is written and acted well, and I found myself actively interested in learning more about them, on top of seeing what kind of Frankenstein's food creation I could turn each one into. Maybe it's because I went in with such low expectations, but Bugsnacks surprised me, and I'm legitimately interested in seeing some kind of follow-up. Or at least an origin story for Bunger. So in a video I put out early in 2020, I made this statement. I wouldn't trust modern-day Activision to make a proper Tony Hawk sequel. Isn't it just fitting that the one year everything went to shit, one of the most notoriously greedy publishers would decide to prove me wrong? The remake of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 does a fantastic job of replicating the fast-paced, crazy combo, high-score thrills I remember experiencing as a kid when I first got my hands on that blue N64 cart. 19 levels worth of ramps, bowls, and rails to trick through with one of two dozen skaters and an absurd number of challenges and unlockables to earn, all without any shady monetization schemes. I can't help but be paranoid, waiting for the day where Activision quietly slides in the microtransactions when no one's looking. But as it is right now, this latest Tony Hawk game is the best the franchise has seen in years, and I was happy to relive the glory days of fun, arcade-style skateboarding. By the way, I know that the Wikipedia page for this game calls it a remaster, but this is absolutely a remake. The official goddamn website has the line, rebuilt from the ground up on it, so whoever wrote this doesn't understand the difference between the terms. I'm right, they're wrong, don't at me. Each year, there's usually one title in the roguelike genre that manages to take up a good chunk of my time, and this year, that particular roguelike was Risk of Rain 2. I'm sorry, fans of Hades, I know you're screaming at me right about now, I just didn't get to play much of it, okay? I'm sure it's awesome. In regards to Risk of Rain 2, though, I know firsthand how great it is. A collection of unique characters that each feel wildly different to play, tight controls, and ever-increasingly frantic encounters seamlessly blend together to make each run as exciting as they are chaotic. 
Its inventive difficulty system, which has the game getting harder and harder with each second that passes, provides a clever risk versus reward element to every playthrough. Sure, you could spend extra time to track down every power-up, but the game will be putting all that new gear to the test sometime down the line. As is standard for the genre, RNG plays a significant role in how far you get in any particular attempt, but even with the worst odds, I never felt like I was dead in the water. And the core loop is so good that dying quickly just means the opportunity to jump in for a second, third, or tenth time. I suspect a bunch of people will overlook this game given its competition, but for me, Risk of Rain 2 is the roguelike to beat. Before anyone asks, this being placed 7th on the list was not planned ahead of time. Given Square Enix's well-documented, messy development cycles, and as someone with no nostalgia for the PS1 original, I was prepared for the Final Fantasy VII Remake to be a total disaster. But I'll be the first to admit it, Square did a fine job with this one. Some stunning production values and high-octane set pieces bring the world of Cloud & Friends to life like never before, and the combat is successfully transformed into a more modern action RPG, while also respecting the turn-based classic by mixing in menu-based skills and teammate orders, making battles continuously engaging. This praise does come with a few big caveats, though. Many of the crazy story changes only hold weight for those intimately familiar with the source material, so plenty ended up going right over my head. The much bigger problem, though, is that this remake is incomplete. What we got only covers the opening hours of the original's plot, and to stretch that out into a 30-hour standalone game, Square added a whole bunch of padding. Some of this new content fleshes out characters and deepens the relationships between party members, but there's plenty of other stuff that is blatant wheel spinning, and because of this, the pacing of the FF7 remake is very erratic, going from blistering to glacial every few hours. It's a credit to the quality cast, presentation, and battle system that I felt compelled to keep trucking along, but I have no doubt this would have been a stronger title if they cut the fat and just made one complete game. Still, I am looking forward to seeing where things go from here. This is the last major title I decided to finish before making my end-of-the-year list due to glowing recommendations from friends. I bet some of you have heard of 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim, but I'm guessing most of you haven't played it. And that's a shame, because it has a roller coaster ride of a narrative. Actually, no, the roller coaster description isn't adequate. It's the whole theme park. This game takes every science fiction idea you can possibly think of, throws them at the wall, and somehow manages to make all of it stick, thanks to strong writing and no shortage of interesting leads. You know how television shows will sometimes end an episode with some kind of reveal or hint at something bigger in order to entice you to keep watching? Well, 13 Sentinels basically does that every 20 minutes for 30 hours. It's not a flawless experience. The real-time strategy battles you're required to complete to further the story aren't anything special. They aren't bad, but they aren't all that remarkable either, so I quickly switched the difficulty to casual just to get through them faster. And while the story is constantly compelling, the non-linear fashion in which it's told and the abundance of exposition scenes full of sci-fi jargon can make it pretty convoluted and hard to clearly follow at points. But by the time the credits roll, you will have all the answers, and slowly unraveling the yarn that takes you there should definitely not be missed. Most of us weren't expecting much out of Doom 2016, but it managed to not only exceed expectations, but blow them away with the force of a quad damage super shotgun. Pardon the cliche, but it truly made you feel like an unstoppable demon slaying force that the minions of hell were right to cower in fear of. Doom Eternal also captures that feeling, but this time, it makes you fucking earn it. Playing through on the ultra-violence difficulty, each encounter in Eternal is a breakneck combat puzzle, where your awareness and reflexes are relentlessly put to the test. 
You're always moving, always adapting, and each of its mechanics work in service of that hectic ballet. Not everyone loves this change in direction, as it does make Eternal much harder to pick up and play for some casual fun, but it undeniably makes every session engrossing. I felt like I needed a cigarette whenever I reached the end of a level. It's not as approachable as its predecessor. Marauders suck. Look, I've watched multiple compelling breakdowns that explain why the Marauder is actually a brilliant inclusion, but I'm sorry, I still don't like him. And the multiplayer doesn't seem like anything special. I don't know, I never bothered playing it. But Doom Eternal is an excellent sequel that manages to make every obstacle overcome seem like a grand accomplishment. If you're up for the challenge, then you'll have a blast ripping and tearing. A lot of people don't know this about me, but I've always been a bit of a hopeless romantic. I'm a sucker for a cute couple with good chemistry. Whenever a long-running series has two characters that obviously like each other from the start, I'm the guy yelling at the screen for them to just tell each other how they feel. You'd think I'd be able to hold on to a girlfriend better. Anyway, I'm telling you all of this so you understand why I like Haven so much. I'd be surprised if you see this game on any other top 10 list, but this tale of two runaway lovers trying to build a life together on a strange planet is wonderfully written, and their strong romance is believably developed throughout the whole game. The interactions between K and U are adorable and cover all the bases you'd expect in a relationship. These two flirt, they joke, they argue, they doubt, they screw like rabbits, every exchange they have cements their status as a real, genuine couple. Like a few other entries on this list, the actual gameplay part is one of the weaker aspects, being simple to a fault. You'll be gliding around environments, cleaning up red goop, and fighting local wildlife in basic turn-based battles. The easygoing nature of everything can be relaxing and doesn't get in the way, but it certainly gets old. There are also some issues with the recording quality, with some voice lines either being too quiet or too loud, but the two leads at the center of everything are so charming and their bond so strong that whatever shortcomings I perceived were easy to look past. As a game, Haven might be simple, but the relationship it showcases is anything but. Can we all just take a second to remember that 2020 was the year an actual, real, honest-to-god Half-Life game came out after 13 years of blue balls? Yeah, it wasn't what fans were asking for all that time, but that shouldn't take away from the excellence of Half-Life Alex. Seamlessly bringing the iconic franchise into VR, Alex is one of the finest examples of what's possible on the ever-expanding platform. Interacting and exploring through varied locations, taking down headcrab zombies and combine soldiers, all while taking in a story that has major unforeseen consequences for the setting as we know it. There are individual elements of Half-Life Alex that are done better in other VR titles, especially shooting and overall combat variety. But what's here is polished to a near immaculate degree, living up to the Valve standard of quality that seemed to be absent for a while there. You can check out my Reviewing Every Half-Life video if you want a more expansive dive into my thoughts on Alex. But all you need to know is if you have some kind of VR headset laying around, this is an absolute must-play. The open-world genre has become oversaturated in the last decade, so much so that whenever a new open-world game is announced, lots of people, including myself, have a knee-jerk negative reaction. I mean, do we really need another continent's worth of side activities to grind through? Well, if the game in question is Ghosts of Tsushima, then the answer is an emphatic yes. A jaw-droppingly gorgeous representation of feudal Japan houses within it some of the best sword-based combat ever created, in addition to solid, if familiar, stealth mechanics. Its map is large and full of content without feeling overwhelming, and the lack of any major barriers like level gating means you aren't forced to engage in something if it doesn't interest you. You do unlock new techniques and abilities as you progress, but the outcomes of battles are always determined by skill rather than arbitrary numbers. The story and characters are 
fine, though the self-serious tone, while totally appropriate for the setting and situation, do make proceedings sort of one note. And despite all it does right, the previously mentioned genre fatigue can make its structure feel tired at times. But the incredible quality of the game itself, not to mention the abundance of post-launch support that added new difficulties, new game plus, and even an entire cooperative multiplayer mode, all without charging a single extra cent, makes Ghost of Tsushima stand out among its contemporaries as an excellent sandbox adventure and one of the best samurai games to date. Similar to last year, I had no idea going into this what game would be number one on my list. I looked through everything I played in 2020, narrowed down that selection to the 10 games you see before you, and went about the process of ordering them. And throughout that, one game in particular kept creeping up my list, and no matter how long I thought about it, I couldn't come up with any reasonable justification for not putting it at the top. And so, my number one game of the year for 2020 is... I played the original Demon's Souls when it first launched 11 years ago on PS3, and instantly fell in love. Its brutal challenge that was constantly satisfying to overcome, its intricately designed levels, unique mechanics, and memorable bosses, all of it cemented my status as a soul genre fan. But as more and more games using the formula came and went, each getting grander in scale and complexity, I personally lost the patience to bash my head against them time and time again. That's why the remake of Demon's Souls is so refreshing to me. The more condensed, straightforward design cuts much of the fat these games accrued over the years, making each obstacle overcome more frequent and impactful. That's on top of the nostalgia that comes with returning to an old favorite. Having not played the original in a decade, I was able to experience this really cool balance where I remembered some things knowing when to avoid and when to keep my guard up, and also forgetting others stumbling into the same traps that had killed me once before. The strict adherence to the original's blueprint does mean the return of certain gameplay quirks, but I found seeing them again to be charming in a weird way, and the handful of true quality-of-life improvements do smooth out some of the rough edges. And I haven't even mentioned how absolutely incredible the new coat of paint is. Without a doubt in my mind the best launch title next-gen consoles had this year, Demon's Souls is a phenomenal remake and my personal favorite game of 2020. And those are my top 10 games of the year. Uh, if that's all you were interested in, thanks for tuning in. Let me know your favorite game of the year down below in the comments. Uh, now I'm gonna do something similar to what I did last year where I just sort of sit here and chat for a little bit about the channel, uh, how it's performed in 2020, and talk about the videos that I put out during the year. In terms of general uh, channel performance and growth, 2020 was actually a bit of a dip for the channel. I got 3.5 million views this year, which is actually slightly higher than 2019, but remember that that view count is taking into account every video I've ever made on the channel, not just stuff I did in 2020. If you just look at the individual videos that I put out this year, the view counts were not as high as anything I did last year. I also had decent subscriber growth. I had 32,000 new subs this year, which is nothing to scoff at, but it is, again, down from last year. I was really hoping that I would be at 100,000 subs by now, but I'm not quite there. I'm really close. Like, as I'm recording this, I think I'm less than a thousand away, seven, eight hundred. So within the month, I do expect to get there, but I was really hoping to do it before we got into 2021. But still, it'll be a nice milestone when I hit it. It'll be a fun way to start the year. Now, I've seen in the past a lot of other creators when they hit a slump like this, they're quick to blame the algorithm. You know, YouTube screwed them over, they did something, and it's all their fault. And while I think those are justified complaints uh, a good amount of the time, in my case, I just think that the videos I made and the topics I decided to cover 
didn't really resonate as much with the audience that I had built up, especially in the second half of the year. I know I could have done way better if I had just chosen different topics that my audience would be interested in, or uh, made one or two more fully scripted videos, or made the one or two reviewing every series that everyone keeps telling me to get to. Hopefully 2021, both for the channel and the world as a whole, will be much, much better. I desperately need a shave and a haircut, so I'm gonna end it there. Thank you for indulging me for as long as you have, and I'll see you all in 2021.